This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. This is Season 2, Episode 12 of The Wow Signal, and this is your host, Paul Carr. Once again, we turn our attention to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, and this time we're going to be joined by Andrew Simeone, who is a SETI scientist at UC Berkeley, and Andrew will explain to us some of the emerging strategies for SETI at the Square Kilometer Array. The Square Kilometer Array is a brand new radio telescope presently under development, and Andrew will explain the stages of development. There's going to be an SKA-1 and an SKA-2. There will be different locations for the SKA. They're Southern Hemisphere locations. And most of the work of the SKA will be astronomy, not SETI, so he'll explain how that's going to work as well. One of the things we're going to talk about is how the Square Kilometer Array will enable a whole new set of strategies in searching for ET signals, not just the narrow band beacons we talked about in the episode on the WOW signal, but a whole wide variety of different kinds of beacons and signals that may contain information. We can even hope to, in some cases, eavesdrop on ET's radar or radio communications. The paper we'll be referring to is called Searching for Extraterrestrial Intelligence with the Square Kilometer Array. It's date submitted on 16 December 2014 and Simeon is the lead author out of a number of co-authors. We'll have a link to this paper's abstract in the show notes, and at the abstract you can download the PDF and read it for yourself. Right after the interview, hang on, we have some interesting things to talk about, including a new science podcast I think you're going to want to listen to. I'd like to start out by sort of laying out the basic facts of what the Square Kilometer Array will be. Sure. Uh, Yeah, well, so the the Square Kilometer Array um, is actually an effort to build a a brand new radio telescope that has approximately uh, a factor of 10, uh, as much collecting area as our largest radio telescopes we have now. So in order of magnitude, more collecting area. And with, uh, with radio astronomy, the, the sensitivity of the instrument is just about directly proportional to the, to the collecting area. So we can also think of that as being 10 times as sensitive uh, or allowing us to see um, you know, significantly deeper into the universe and, and look for, in the case of SETI, look for intelligent civilizations uh, much, much more, uh, much, much deeper into, into the galaxy or into the universe uh, than we have been able to in the past. And the, the actual number for a square kilometer comes from the amount of collecting area that would be necessary uh, with sort of current receiver technology to detect the hydrogen, the neutral hydrogen in a gas similar to the Milky Way at a, at a redshift of one. Okay. Now, your paper mentions square kilometer array one and two. How are they different? Well, so these are... Um, uh, uh, sort of steps, I think, uh, on the way to actually completely building out the square kilometer array. So the the the, the full square kilometer of collecting area with um, frequency coverage from uh, a few tens of megahertz uh, all the way up to 
to several gigahertz, perhaps 10 or 12 gigahertz, uh, comes from, um, uh, so th let me just, let me just back up. So the, the squark, uh, the SK one and SK two, uh, as I said, are, um, are, are sort of steps on our way to getting us ultimately to this square kilometer of collecting area that we want. And the full square kilometer array, uh, would cost something like, uh, three or $4 billion to build, uh, sort of based on our, our best current estimates. And, and that's a, a significant amount of money to, to get right off the top for a scientific project. So the, the idea is to build the array in stages. And so SKA1 is the, is the first stage. And SKA2 is the second stage, which would actually get us to the full square kilometer of collecting area. So SKA1 is, has what's called a cost cap. So there's a, a certain amount of money that's been pledged by the member countries uh, within the, the SKA organization for the first phase of, of building uh, a, a SKA-1. And that number is about 650 million euros. And so that's going to get us uh, you know, a, certain, a certain way there uh, to, to a full square kilometer collecting area, but it'll take significantly more money, uh, approximately another two and a half or, or three and a half billion dollars, a uh, billion euro, uh, to get us all the way to the Full, the full square kilometer of, of collecting area. And the array itself is actually made up of, of multiple components. So each component of the array is itself made up of multiple dishes, but uh, actually at a higher level than the multiple dishes, there's actually multiple components of the telescope. And the, the current specification for the telescope has three components. There's something called SKA low, which is the low frequency component that will be sensitive to um, radio frequencies from about uh, 50 or 60 megahertz up to a couple of hundred megahertz. Uh, and that's going to be built in uh, southern Australia. There's a component called SKA mid, uh, which will have sensitivity between uh, several hundred megahertz, say uh, eight or 900 megahertz, uh, and several gigahertz. And that component will be built in southern Africa. And then there's a third component called SKA survey, which is a, a, a mid-frequency component, so a, a, a part of the telescope that will have sensitivity between about 1 and 2 gigahertz, uh, but will have a very, very large field of view. Now, you talk about uh, something called commensal observing for SETI. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, sure. So commensal is kind of a, kind of a funny word. Um, it actually comes from biology, and it literally refers to two organisms eating out of the same the same trough. So the co co mensal uh, is what is what the the word actually means. But I think a, a, an easier way of thinking about it is sort of piggyback observing. Um, and it so it turns out this is maybe not something that would be obvious to someone that's familiar with optical telescopes. Uh, but it turns out that. At radio wavelengths, it's possible to take the signal that's collected from the large antenna or the large radio telescope and amplify it and then copy it many, many times and send it to many, many different observers or different instruments with no loss in sensitivity to anyone that's, that's using the telescope. Everybody that's using the telescope uh, gets the full, the full collecting area and can do anything that they want with the data. So with an optical telescope, when we're thinking about, about photons and we have mirrors, we might have beam splitters that could split the light. But actually, at, at radio wavelengths, it's possible to, to copy the light. Uh, so again, we can, we can share the telescope with many, many observers. And this is actually how the SETI at Home project works at, at the Arecibo telescope. So anytime anyone is using the Arecibo telescope, we get a, a copy of the signal from uh, whatever radio receiver is in place. And then we can analyze that signal with a, a special set of, of digital hardware, a special set of computers that are specially programmed to search for the kinds of signals that we might expect from an advanced extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, so this is a, a capability that, that we've shown is, is very, very, very powerful for uh, telescopes like Arecibo, uh, single-dish telescopes. But it's even more powerful for telescopes that are, that are made up of multiple dishes, that are interferometers. Uh, like the SKA will be, or like the VLA, the, the Very Large Array, um, is, for example, now. And the reason why this, this kind of technique is so much more powerful 
if you have many telescopes, is because of the way that the, the signals are stitched together when you use an interferometer, uh, it actually enables the, the SETI observer to choose where the telescope is pointed. So when we observe in this commensal or piggyback mode with Arecibo, we have absolutely no choice uh, in where the telescope is pointed. Uh, whoever is, is the, what we call the primary observer or the primary user of the telescope, the person that actually was awarded the telescope time, they decide where the telescope is pointed. But with an interferometer, it's actually possible via the use of, uh, of a special digital technology, an algorithm called, called beamforming, to actually electronically steer the telescope to multiple positions on the sky, uh, as long as you're within something called the, the primary beam of the telescope. So for SETI, what that means is, is that uh, we have a, a lot more different targets to choose from uh, with an interferometer uh, as we would with a single dish telescope. And although it's, it's piggyback observing, so we don't actually move the, the dishes themselves within the instrument, we can actually point the telescope at different objects uh, within the primary beam of the telescope. So it's, it's really a, a dramatically more powerful way of doing this piggyback observing. And this is the way that we will observe with the square kilometer array. Right now, um, how, do you, how are you going to pick the targets? For, uh, I mean, you obviously, you're, you're stuck with whatever primary field of view you have. Do you have a set of targets in that field of view that you can observe? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. So you probably know, and I'm sure your listeners have, have heard, that there are a lot of different ideas about what sorts of, of stars or extrasolar planets make good SETI targets. Uh, some people think that we should look at, at known extrasolar planets or uh, extrasolar planetary systems that, that look something like, like the Earth or our own solar system. Uh, other people think that we should concentrate on, on very nearby stars. Uh, some people think that we should look at, at sort of exotic objects in the, in the universe. So maybe we should look at, at pulsars or at supernova or maybe the opposite direction to pulsars or the opposite direction to supernova. And still other people think that we should look at, for example, our own galactic center uh, or maybe even target other galaxies. And all of these different types of targets that you might choose come from different assumptions that you might make about the the energy distribution of extraterrestrial transmitters, so how, how frequently you see transmitters of some specific brightness, or um, maybe some assumptions about, about the prevalence of, of intelligence and what kind of things might, might be required for the development of intelligent civilization. So, for example, a, a certain metallicity in a, in a stellar type or, or something like that. Uh, but, but really, you know, there are a lot of different ideas, and I, I don't think that any one idea looks better than, than the other. So what we envision for uh, SETI on the, on the square kilometer array is a, a huge catalog that takes into account many of the varying ideas about different targets that we might, that we might look at. So we'll probably have a target, of several, uh, target catalog of, of several million objects, uh, and depending on where the, as you said, where the primary field of view is pointed, we'll look through that catalog for, for some objects that that look interesting to us in that particular part of the sky. Now, how long do you think you can observe on any particular object? And is it, uh, assu assuming that the uh, there's a beacon aimed at us, would it be aimed at? Uh, would it, are we expected to be aimed at us all the time? Or uh, well, that that's that's another um, a good question. So this uh, oftentimes we call the the sort of freak that we see a particular signal, the duty cycle of the transmitter, so how often it's on versus how off, often it's off. And, and some people believe, there's some reasons to believe that we might see continuous beacons. Uh, there's other reasons to believe that we might see intermittent beacons. So, you know, ultimately in a SETI experiment, really in, in many fields of astronomy, what you want is to be able to look at the entire sky all the time. But we're not, we're not there yet in terms of the technology, although, uh, although we will be probably in the next several decades. Uh, and we can, we can talk a little bit about that if you want. But um, with the square kilometer array, the, the duration that we observe any given field is largely going to be governed by what the primary observer is doing with the telescope. So for some, for some purposes uh, in, in astrophysics and in, in radio astronomy, you might want to point the telescope at one place in the sky for... Um, for several hours or, or maybe over the course of, 
of several months, you might spend hundreds of hours on that one position on the sky because maybe you're looking for a very rare event or you're looking at a very, very faint object. Uh, so when the telescope is being used in that way, we're going to get a lot of time on a small set of stars, a small set of targets, uh, and we'll be able to be sensitive to, to more rare, uh, intermittent kind of, kinds of signals. But other times, the square kilometer array will be used for surveys. So it might, um, with each pointing, uh, the primary observer might spend 30 minutes on a given pointing or maybe an hour on a given pointing and then move to a, 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 another nearby position. So when the telescope is being used like that, uh, we'll only be able to, to integrate or to observe for between 30 minutes and an hour, say. Uh, and we'll, we'll sort of probe a different, different part of the, of the parameter space. Your uh, paper mentions just simply searching over a volume of space. Is that, uh, can you explain how that works? Yeah, so, you know, we can, we know approximately, uh, you know, how many, how many stars uh, there are in our, in our stellar neighborhood. Um, so there's something like uh, 0.1 stars per cubic parsec or, or thereabouts, 0.2. Um, so we can we could define if we would like a, a particular volume of, of space, so a, a number of light years or a number of parsecs from from the Earth uh, that we could that we could probe in such a way to to look at every single object which is in that that volume of, of space, and we call that a, a volume limited sample. Uh, and I, I think that's something that that we're going to be able to do. Uh, with the with the square kilometer array, and I think it's a very powerful statement to say that we've searched, you know, uh, twenty five thousand stars or fifty thousand stars within uh, some particular volume. Uh, and you know, I, of course, ideally, uh, the the goal of of SETI experiments is to actually detect extraterrestrial intelligence. But uh, so far, we haven't detected extraterrestrial intelligence, and so we're we've been thinking about ways to to be able to make more robust statistical statements about the searches that we do, uh, which is just to, to, to do um, a more complete sampling of a set of stars or in, or in, in frequency coverage or wavelength coverage. And, and probing a, a specific volume of space around the Earth is, is sort of a step in that direction. Right. Now, traditionally, SETI has looked at uh, for very narrow band signals, uh, but you're, you're going to be looking for a lot of different types of signals. Can you give us some examples? Should be looking for? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so the the initial um, uh, Kakoni and Morrison and Frank Drake style SETI uh, that that really began in the in the early '60s and and continued on into the the NASA SETI program in the in the '80s and the '90s. The, the original idea of those experiments was to look for, as you said, very narrow band signal. So a lot of electromagnetic energy concentrated in a very narrow frequency range, like a like a carrier wave that might be. Um, associated with our own analog early radio transmissions. And there were a couple of reasons why those types of signals were suggested. Uh, one, I, a, a very good reason is, is that um, nature doesn't tend to do that. Um, ultimately, uh, at, the, at the root of most astrophysical electromagnetic emission is some kind of random motions of, of atoms or, or molecules or gas. And that tends to broaden in frequency or in time, the, the signal that we get from those objects. And so it's, it, it's very, very rare for, for the natural objects to have very concentrated uh, electromagnetic energy in, in frequency or in, or in time. So it's easy to tell the difference between a, a narrowband signal and a, an astrophysical emission. Um, also, as I said, these types of signals were, were used by our earlier uh, radio communication. So you know, when we looked at, at the kind of radio technology that we had just developed, uh, the idea that, that maybe we should look for similar kinds of, uh, of signals made a lot of sense. Uh, and it also turns out that these narrowband things, very narrowband signals, get through the, what we call the interstellar medium, uh, specifically the plasma, the, the ionized gas between the stars. Narrowband signals can get through that very, very readily. Uh, so we know that, that these types of signals could be transmitted very large distances uh, all the way across the galaxy. Uh, but as sort of the, the field of SETI has matured and our own technology has matured, uh, the ideas people have about the types of signals that we might want to search for has, has changed. Uh, some people think that uh, it's more 
likely from a sort of a uh, energy economics standpoint for an advanced intelligence to build a broadband signal. Just that it's it's cheaper uh, in terms of, of detectability to build a broadband pulsed radio beacon rather than a narrow band beacon. And this is a an idea that is that's been espoused in a number of papers by um by Jim Benford and Gregory Benford and, and others. Um, other people think that that maybe uh, wideband signals might be preferable because they allow us to encode more information in the signal. So there's a, a thought that if a very advanced intelligence went to all the trouble of creating a beacon, they wouldn't want to transmit just one bit of information. They wouldn't want to just say, hey, we're here. They would want to communicate uh, some information or some idea uh, to anyone that might be listening. And if they wanted to do that, it's likely that they would choose some broadband communication scheme. Uh, so we're trying to, to the to the best of our ability, we're trying to to make our new experiments sensitive to a wider class of signals. The the problem is, and the reason why this is so difficult is, is that when you add um, additional uh, sort of unknowns to the type of signal that you're looking for, the the bandwidth, the symbol range. Uh, the, um, uh, the 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 types of symbols, the the symbol alphabet, uh, it it increases the search space, so it increases the computational complexity of what you're doing uh, many times over. So it's while it's true that if you if you make some if you restrict the sort of some of those things, then you can you might be able to search for these types of signals. Um, uh, effectively, uh, you're you're only sort of able to do that because you because you again you restrict the parameters of your search. So the the sort of moral of this is is that the the more different kinds of signals that we search for, the more computing it takes. Uh, and thankfully, computers are getting a lot faster, so we're able to do this. But it's something that that is very much in kind of the the development phase. That's sort of the kind of the cutting edge of of radio SETI is looking for new new signal types. I would say. Now, um, you mentioned something. Well, I, I, okay, well, before we get off this work longer array, uh, have you have you done the statistics in terms of how how long is, if you say surveyed this guy for five years or something like that using commensal observing, what the probability detection would be given some reasonable assumptions? Um, well, I think it, ultimately what we're going to be able to do in five years with the SKA is not, um, a hundred percent clear because it depends on, on how the telescope is going to be used by, by other observers. Um, so I, we have certainly calculated the um, the number of stars that we're going to be able to to survey to a to a particular sensitivity um, compared with uh, you know compared with other searches, but we haven't. I guess we haven't sort of turned that into a to a to a punchline. So, um, for example, we might say you know after five years of commensal observing on the SKA, we'll be able to put a limit of no more than one in and stars possessing a transmitter uh, at a particular luminosity level. Um, that's not something that, that we've done rigorously because there are some uncertainties in how the telescope uh, would, would be used. But I think um, there, there are some hints about that. And, um, you know, I think one of the, in my mind, I think one of the most compelling things about the square kilometer array in terms of, of limit and, and sensitivity is is that with SKA two, so with the full square kilometer array, we will for the very first time be sensitive to to leakage level radiation from some nearby stars. So these are our radio transmitters that have about the same um, energy or about the same luminosity as our brightest radio and TV transmitters here on Earth, and um, we would be sensitive to to emission at that, that level. Um, uh, from about a dozen or so nearby nearby stars. Yeah, I think something you said about uh, to ten parsecs the um, the 
SK-1 could detect a, like a like a air, aircraft control rate. Yeah, there's there's kind of three three categories of signals that I kind of keep in my mind uh, when I'm doing a radio SETI experiment um, in terms of of what we call terrestrial analogs. So sort of things that we have on Earth. Uh, that are similar to the types of things that we might detect. So at the very highest luminosity level, you have um, the, the Arecibo planetary radar. This is the, the radar system that's attached to the Arecibo telescope. And then several orders of magnitude down, you have uh, aircraft radar, very bright aircraft radar. And these tend to be, be fairly beamed. They're not what we would consider omnidirectional. They only illuminate a, a fairly narrow angle on the sky. So significantly more, they illuminate significantly more sky than the Arecibo uh, radar, but, but they're not omnidirectional. And then again, several orders of magnitude down, you have, I think, what we would consider really omnidirectional transmitters, like our, our radio and TV transmitters that, that illuminate a, a really a large fraction of the sky. Uh, and, and those are what I'm talking about from a, a, few, a few nearby stars. But you could you can think about sort of the the distance limit of those three different types of transmitters as something like uh, you know with SK two a few parsecs uh, for the so so a handful of stars for the for the omnidirectional stuff uh, maybe a, a hundred or two hundred parsecs for the the aircraft radars and um, and really across the galaxy for the for the Arecibo planetary radars with the SKA but also that. It, Implicit in those calculations are, are something we call the, the integration time. So the amount of time that you can that you can sort of add up the signal uh, to detect something that's very very weak. And and again, that's uh, that's dependent on on how the telescope uh, is being used. I should I should point out that we've done an awful lot of talking about about commensal observing, and certainly you know I think that's where the real bread and butter of the SETI science is going to be with the SKA, just because we're going to get so much time on the telescope. And because of this really cool way that we're going to be able to use the telescope in terms of pointing at, at positions that we actually choose. But we will also uh, ask for time uh, that, that really belongs to us as SETI observers with the SKA. And I'm not sure how much we'll get, but if we're lucky, we'll get maybe, maybe 24 or 36 hours a year, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. And during that time, we can use the telescope however we want. So if we find something that's promising uh, in a nearby star or, or another galaxy or, or wherever, if we decide that we really wanted to do something uh, that we're not getting by commensal observing, there will be a mechanism where we can, uh, we can request observing time uh, and, and get awarded truly, truly our own observing time to do with the telescope what we would like. In the past, there have been uh, protocols where if you detect a signal with one telescope, you bring up other telescopes worldwide to see if they see the same thing. But that won't really be possible with the SKA first, will it? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, certainly the, if we ever found something, and I, I think this has maybe happened a couple of times in, in really the history of Radio SETI, but if we find something that we absolutely cannot rule out as being terrestrial, as being uh, some artifact of our own technology when we're doing a SETI search, then the, the first thing that we want to do is we want to find another telescope uh, to observe it. And uh, with the SKA, uh, the, the sort of the issue I think maybe that you're alluding to is that the instrument will be so sensitive that it will be difficult to find another telescope that has similar sensitivity uh, in order to follow up on the signal. And I think that's true. But if you imagine that we um, detect something with the SKA in, in five minutes uh, at a, you know, a particular signal-to-noise ratio, uh, we, could, we could follow up on it with a telescope that maybe is you know, five times smaller and just integrate for 25 times longer. Uh, so, so we can we can follow up on it with other telescopes, but it just might take us a little bit more time uh, to to integrate down so that we can actually see it. I see. And you know, I would say that personally, that's not something that I'm I'm super worried about because generally, it's much easier to find something again once you found it once. So when we do a SETI search, we have to set the what we call the the false alarm rate or the or the the sensitivity threshold 
pretty high uh, in order to actually have detection because we're we're always trying to sort of tell the difference between terrestrial interference and something that really is coming from from the sky. But if we knew exactly what what frequency or what bandwidth or what particular signal type we were looking for, and we knew exactly where to expect to find it on the sky, then we could probably redetect it with a significantly less sensitive instrument. Now, uh, you mentioned earlier we don't presently have a capability to scan the entire sky simultaneously. Um, I know that Ohio State developed a tiny prototype of something like that called Argus, but uh, it's not very sensitive. Uh, yeah, where would we? How would we get that kind of capability? And, well, uh, so this is a the, these technologies are are sort of generically called um, called aperture arrays, and um, and basically what you have is a whole bunch of of little tiny detectors spread out over a really large area on on the ground usually. And um, and then the signals from all of those little elements are stitched together with a with a computer with a supercomputer really. So each individual element, each individual little antenna, can actually see the whole sky. Uh, and then what the supercomputer does is it it phases them up so it it sort of points in in one direction or two directions uh, with with all of the different elements so that you can so that you can see multiple places on the sky. And that the number of places that you can see on the sky, so sort of the number of different positions you can look at, uh, is directly proportional to how much computing power you have attached to this to this array. And um, and you're right that that right now the the little individual elements are just are just not very sensitive, and the the accuracy with which they can be um, can be phased up or sort of all pointed in one direction. Uh, is limited by by a number of factors, but this this is a technology that is actively under under development in in radio astronomy, and it actually already works very well at low radio frequencies. So there's a telescope in in low or in Europe called LOFAR, the Low Frequency Array, uh, that we're actually using for for SETI. That that is this this type of technology. It's a whole bunch of of little tiny antennas spread all over Europe, uh, mostly in the in the Netherlands. And then the whole the, the whole telescope part is actually is actually done electronically uh, within a, within a supercomputer. So it, it works pretty well at low frequencies, but getting it to the point where that technology works very well uh, at at sort of gigahertz frequencies, which is usually where we do SETI experiments, is going to take a, a couple of decades. Mm. And um, and also to get Sort of the enough computing available that we can that we can truly form what we call forming beams or, or pointing the telescope that we can truly point the telescope at many many positions on the sky all at once. Right now, uh, I have a couple of questions about SETI at home from listeners. Um, the uh, and these are people who actually run SETI at home on their computers at home. Uh, cool and. Uh, For- let me say to your to your listeners that run SETI at home uh, on their home computers or their cell phones. Thank you very much. Uh, we we really appreciate it. It's fantastic that, that they're participating. Yeah. Well, one one listener asked, uh, "Is it still helping to compute data even these days of vast cloud computing networks? Has it found any data that was deemed interesting?" Um, it, it it does, and it, it we are constantly finding signals uh, that are interesting to us. So the way that that SETI at home works kind of after um, after the, the the screensaver runs on your computer is that your computer sends back uh, results to to our servers here at Berkeley, and then those results get put into a big database that contains all the signals that have ever been detected by by SETI at home, and then we have a a sort of a little robot that combs through that database, and we call it the the nit picker, uh, the near time persistency checker. Uh, that basically looks for for individual signals that um, are persistent on the on, on the celestial sphere. So signals that we detect at the same frequency or near the same frequency um, from the same position on the sky, and then periodically that little robot that scans through the database generates a list of of candidates, and then we go to the telescope and and reobserve those, and um, that. That process uh, runs runs all the time. Uh, the The last time that we did some of those observations at Arecibo was about two years ago, 
but we're excited to, to do it again soon, uh, as soon as we have another list of, of candidates. Uh, and there's also some, some new, uh, new developments with SETI at Home that are really going to increase the, the power of, of SETI at Home as a, as a, as a, kind of a SETI search instrument. Um, we have uh, two projects, one that will allow uh, SETI at Home, the SETI at Home client, to process a much wider bandwidth uh, than it does now. So basically it'll allow us to look at a hundred or a thousand times more of the radio spectrum than we've ever looked at in the past. Uh, and we're also adding a capability to the, the screensaver to process data from other telescopes. So pretty soon, uh, in addition to being able to select, you know, when, when your computer wakes up and, and when it's going to process and whether or not it's going to use your, your GPU and how much memory it's going to use, you're also going to be able to pick which parts of the radio spectrum your computer searches and also which telescopes your computer uses. So, for example, if you think that uh, maybe we should search for signals uh, around uh, two times the, the rest frequency of, of uh, the, the hydrogen uh, hyperfine transition that we search. So we, we do a lot of, many of your probably regular listeners know that we do a lot of SETI around 1.4 gigahertz. Well, maybe you think that we should look at 2.8 gigahertz. You could select that part of the radio spectrum, and then your computer would spend all of its time processing data from that part of the of the radio spectrum. Okay. Uh, so you definitely could use more people running SETI at home. Yes, definitely. And I'll say that there was a there was a period of time where we had a very limited. Uh, um, internet connection. So this was, I think, between about mm, 2000 and maybe 2007, 2008, maybe 2011 or 2012, where computers were getting much, much, much faster, uh, but our internet connection wasn't getting any faster. So people were requesting more and more uh, work units, more and more little chunks of the sky uh, to process, but they were returning it to us so quickly that we were saturating our, our internet connection. But we've solved that um, sort of in a, in a temporary way now. We went from a, a 100 megabit Ethernet connection to a gigabit uh, network connection for the project. And very soon, uh, we're going to move to even more bandwidth, uh, and we'll have you know, between 10 and 40 gigabits available to us uh, that will be more than enough to handle all of the, the participants. Great. Well, okay, listeners, you, you heard them. Don't set at home on your, uh, on your machine. Okay. Yeah, well, I, Andrew. If many of your listeners probably know this, but uh, SETI at Home now works not only on uh, on computers, but also on on cell phones, on Android cell phones. So if you have an Android smartphone, uh, whenever you you can download uh, Boink and you can download SETI at Home, and whenever you have it plugged into the wall and with Wi-Fi connectivity, so it's not going to use your battery and it's not going to use your data plan, it'll turn on. Uh, SETI at home, and it'll process uh, process data from from our radio telescopes right there on your cell phone. I did not know that. I'm going to get it right away. Okay, uh, Andrew, thanks so much for your time. Uh, I think we know a lot more about the SKA than we did before, and uh, we'll uh, you'll, you'll be uh, this will be out in a week or so. so Great. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk to you anytime. Okay. Paul. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye. Bye. I'd like to apologize for the noise on my end of that interview. I trace that to low batteries in my Zoom. We had just moved house and I, uh, things were chaotic and I didn't get a chance to change the batteries before the interview started. I thought it would be all right. I was mistaken. I promise that won't be repeated. So um, in future episodes, I'll be using better equipment than the Zoom, but the Zoom is handy and I just fish out of my backpack, plug it in the computer and I can go. So, uh, thanks to Andrew Simeon, and I sure hope we'll be hearing more from him soon, uh, more from the Square Kilometer Array. And as he pointed out, we want to start thinking about omnidirectional radio telescopes to catch transients, including potential um, beacons from that would be of interest to SETI. The wow signal was only caught fortuitously 
Uh, there have been other wow signal type events detected, but they're only caught briefly because at any given time, we're only looking at less than 1% of the sky with radio telescopes. Commensal observing makes that a little better, but it doesn't make it much better because after all, we're only, uh, we're only looking at a tiny fraction of the sky. The ability of the SKA to form secondary beams is helpful, but doesn't really solve that problem. What we really need are omnidirectional radio telescopes. So, uh, we'll follow up on that in a future episode, perhaps with Andrew, perhaps with someone else. As Bob Dixon mentioned, there has been a project at Ohio State, which is a tiny little uh, prototype that sits on a roof at uh, at the main campus. Now, here's something a little different. Uh, we're going to play a promo for another non-commercial science podcast. This one is for Under the Microscope, a, a new biology podcast. Under the Microscope is not your average science show. We break down complicated biological processes in a way that won't break your brain. We'll make you laugh, and you're guaranteed to learn something interesting. After downloading our latest episode, head over to utmpodcast.com, where you can decide what we put under the microscope next time. Well, thanks to Under the Microscope, and I hope that you will uh, give them a listen. A couple of announcements. One is that we are preparing for the first episode of the Unseen Podcast. If you want to participate in the Unseen Podcast, which is a spinoff from this podcast, although unscripted, unedited, and with open participation, go over to the Google Plus community, the Unseen Podcast participants, and sign up, and we will we'll get you on the air. It's that simple. You'll receive an invitation. If you can't make it that night, you can, uh, you can, you'll get another invitation for another night. It should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to try to do it every week, sometimes with myself as host moderator, other times with other people, and sometimes in a more European-friendly time slot, sometimes in a more East Coast U.S. time slot. So come on over, and, and we'll talk about SETI. We'll talk about SETA. We'll talk about astrobiology. We'll talk about exoplanets. We'll talk about the Fermi Paradox. And you can bring your own ideas and thoughts to the podcast. And this is something that I've been wanting to do. I'm finally just going to create the structure and make it happen. The next thing I want to talk about is supporting the wow signal. We've talked about this before. I won't go into a great deal of detail. The podcast will always be free. The podcast will never have a bonus section or a premium. There will never be ads on the podcast. What you can do, however, if you want to see this podcast grow and prosper, and get better, and reach a wider audience, you can go to patreon.com slash wowsignal, sign up for a very small contribution per episode, and you can cap your monthly contribution, by the way, so you don't have to worry about me putting out 100 episodes in a month. You don't have to worry about that anyway, but just in case you were, you can cap your contribution, and then Support the wow signal with a very small amount. I don't think that we deserve, frankly, to be your primary charity. There's lots of other things that are a lot more worthwhile. But just a, a few bucks here and there will help a lot. And if we can get enough people subscribing on Patreon, we will do a lot more. And we will sound better. We will come out more often. And we will reach many more people. So... Join Stephen Fernandez and others who are helping us on Patreon.com. Go on over there. I'd appreciate it. Please join us in our Google Plus community or in our subreddit. Discuss the shows. Discuss the topics. Tell us me who you would like to see on as guests. And we'll have a, a good conversation going back and forth. Coming up soon, we've got some very good stuff. 
Mike Mongo recently gave me a very good interview. Uh, he may have another one soon. We'll put those together into an episode. I am expecting to interview a, an important and very well-known planetary scientist at the end of this month. We also plan to discuss asteroid mining with Jose Luis Galache and a few other people. Uh, we need to get that panel together. We're not quite there yet. And uh, we will have many more bursts. I'm going to challenge the members of the team to each come up with a burst. There have been four so far. The latest one was with Daniel Carton. I think there will be some, quite a few more. We'll take a, a brief hiatus, probably in May and maybe June, and then come back perhaps in July or August with a number of new episodes. During the hiatus, bursts may come out anyway as we come up with short topics that we can handle quickly. And when we come back, we'll be in Season 3. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing from you on the Unseen podcast. So once again, I'd like to thank our guest, Andrew Simeon of the University of California, Berkeley. And I'd like to thank our musicians, DJ Spooky and Erica Lloyd, and coming up very shortly, Jason Robinson. And thank you for listening. This is your host, Paul Carr. So do you like music with more than one thing going on at the same time, yet somehow working all together? I do. So here's Jason Robinson with Stratum 3. This has been the Wow Signal, a podcast produced by the Dream of Open Channel. Please visit WowSignalPodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license.
Thank <laughs> you.